but not for May. Yeah. Next year. Okay. Sure. September. Welcome to the Institute for Life Course and Aging. Thanks so much for coming out today. This is the third last seminar we have in our series for this year. There are two more Wednesdays, um, next Wednesday and Wednesday after that. And there are flyers here at the front uh, for people who are not here and are on the web. Um, you can look on our website to see the next couple of seminars coming up. Um, today we're very pleased to have with us Dr. Barry Goldless. Uh, Barry is a member of our, our um, NICE, which stands for the National Initiative for the Care of the Elderly uh, organization. And he's also been uh, speaking here before the Institute. He is currently director of the uh, geriatric division at the University of Toronto. He's also director of the geriatric program that's jointly run by the Toronto Rehab Institute and the University Health Network. Um, he's also editor-in-chief of Geriatrics and Aging, so we're very much looking forward to having you come today and talk to us about the geriatric syndrome. Thank you very much. So uh, my title is, what is a geriatric syndrome? Why does it matter anyway? It's a good question. Obviously for me it matters because that's my life's work. <laughs> uh, so uh, we always have to start off with objectives. And so I'm going to describe some of the common geriatric syndromes and their, and I put that in quotation marks, causative factors because they're correlations rather than causes, things that add together. It's hard to know what's causing anything sometimes when you've got a, a frail older person. And we're going to explain how these causative factors result in a different diagnostic and management process that is typically understood by most doctors. And that's a, a problem. It's, it's uh, when geriatricians pull their hair out in the hospital, it's not because the knowledge is lacking frequently in the uh, and their colleagues, it's just that the approach to diagnosis and management is so different in, in, in the traditional way than the way geriatricians understand it. And then we're going to describe the clinical and research implications of geriatric syndromes. Uh, and just a, a brief history, even though uh, the term geriatrics was coined in the United States by Nasher in the first decade of the 20th century, it really gained prominence in the United Kingdom. So that was where geriatric, clinical geriatrics as we know it now was born. And Marjorie Warren was the pioneer. And uh, in, in, in those days, she found that there were many elderly people who were consigned to chronic hospitals and sort of put in wards and the doors locked behind them and uh, forgotten about. So amnesia is good, I guess, if you don't want to care for people. But she found that many of these people had reversible problems. You could manage their medical problems, rehabilitate them, and go home. And so that was a huge, uh, we, don't, we don't see as many of those patients anymore because some of those principles are now understood more generally. But when she started, it was very different. Warehousing was the way to go for older people who weren't functioning well. And uh, what Marjorie Warren uh, showed was that diagnosis alone is, is uh, not enough. You have to know how the person is functioning. We see that all the time. You get two people who have 10 medical diagnoses that are identical. One is bedridden and one is playing tennis on a regular basis. So lists of diseases don't translate well into what that person looks like and can do. And yet that's the way we're taught in medicine is to focus on the disease processes rather than what the person's able to do and what their function is like. And What's the traditional medical folks say? I, I guess Sherlock Holmes is a classical person. If you, if you can pay attention to all the clues, remember, I think it was Dr. Bell who was uh, Conan Doyle's uh, professor who he modeled uh, Sherlock Holmes on. Uh, if you can figure out uh, all the clues, you come up with the answer, everything becomes extremely clear. That's still sometimes true for specific diseases, and uh, the other thing that we, I was taught was crucial uh, in medical school was to try and explain things by one diagnosis. And, and that uh, Oakham's razor, Oakham uh, was a medieval uh, healthcare or scientist, I guess. Uh, you see, it, it's spelled about 20 different ways in the literature, so you can deal with a K, a CH, but basically it's translated down to the law of parsimony. In other words, the fewer diseases, the, 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 the most simple, elegant explanation that you can come with is probably the correct one. 
And that, and then the other thing I was taught is that the cornerstone, particularly in internal medicine, the specialty that I come out of, that management is straightforward once the diagnosis is made. And so everything depends on that Sherlock Holmes type reasoning to figure out, detect the clues, understand them, and make that brilliant diagnosis. And uh, however, I don't think that's the way the world really works now. If you look at a hospital, for example, where I work, most of the people who are sick and in the hospital are old, right? And if, if you've lived to be 80 or 85 years old, and you can't string together at least a half a dozen medical diagnoses that you have, you're not trying. <laughs> you, 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 you haven't given it a good effort. And, and, and it's easy in most elderly people, even those who are healthy, I don't know, come up with six or seven medical diagnoses. They have hypertension, they have cataracts, they have osteoarthritis of the knee. You can just keep on, they have type two diabetes, whatever it is. It's pretty easy to come up with a fairly lengthy list on most people. And so that unlike what Sherlock Holmes was doing, where there's a Q event, uh, the current medical era is dominated by chronic disease and its exacerbations, not acute illness. But yes, there are still acute illnesses, um, but the, what's driving healthcare now is chronic disease and its exacerbations. And the biggest failure, obviously, of, of modern medicine is not to manage those chronic diseases well, well enough to minimize the exacerbations. Uh, I'll give you an example. We'll, we'll go away from geriatrics, but asthma. Every time somebody ends up in a hospital or an emergency department with asthma, almost invariably, it's because the management of the chronic disease failed. Either because you didn't educate the patient well enough, you didn't manage them well enough. Almost, and, and, and that's true for most medical diagnoses. Most of the people with diabetes who end up in hospital, it's because the chronic care of their problems was not managed as effectively as it could be. Um, and the truth is that uh, unlike you know, Sherlock Holmes, where he was so much more brilliant, I hate to say this because I'm a doctor, most medical diagnoses do not require brilliance. In other words, the, the, let's say that one of the biggest plagues uh, endangering the health of middle-aged and elderly people now, obesity and type 2 diabetes. All you need to do is look at the person and take a, a, a pinprick of their finger to see what the blood sugar is, and that's all the diagnostic acumen you, you need. Yet we all know anybody, really somebody like me who has struggled a bit with weight, the management of obesity, which is central to the management of diabetes mellitus, is not easy. It's extraordinarily difficult. Um, and that's the case with most chronic diseases because there isn't a simple pill usually for it and the management is very difficult. And the other thing that we, we've forgotten in the traditional medical model is that controlling your blood sugar is not the determinant of quality of life, right? The end point is not having a blood sugar that's normal. The end point is being able to enjoy life, right? And so we, we make that mistake in many ways. One is that we think that the final endpoint is the, uh, the blood sugar, when in fact it's quality of life, ability to participate, functional ability. We also make that, in, on the macro level, we make that, we, we've changed the healthcare system into one of the uh, pillars of Canadian uh, life, whereas in fact it's only enabling, right? But some important parts given to enjoy life, theater, literature, outdoors, whatever your interests are, the end care is not, the end point is not health care. That's an enabler to allow the proper end point, which is very depending on what kind of a person you are. And we've mixed up the enabler with the end point, in my opinion, uh, and have forgotten uh, what's truly important for normal human beings. I'm not saying that health and good medical care isn't important insofar as it makes, allows you to enjoy life. And so, what is a geriatric syndrome? And in geriatrics, it's the opposite of what I was taught in internal medicine. So the, the classic kind of syndrome would be uh, in, in what you see at sick children's hospital, where one gene is wrong, so they've got a genetic defect, and there are a hundred different things. Their kidneys aren't working, they're mentally retired, they have a funny looking face, a typical pattern. Uh, Down syndrome would be one example. One gene, or in this case it's one chromosome extra, and there's a whole multitude of things from atresia of the, of the you know, blockages of the duodenal tract and in the, in the gastrointestinal tract in the duodenum 
general abnormalities of the heart, problems with intellect, a whole bunch of, uh, of uh, physical appearance, so a whole bunch of things from one chromosomal uh, addition in this case. Uh, and that's what we usually think of as a syndrome. But in geriatrics, it's, it's different. The, the, the human organism can only react in certain ways. And what happens uh, in geriatrics is that many things are happening, but the, the presentation seems the same for all. So people fall. People become confused. People become incontinent. There could be a hundred different factors for each one. There's always going to be overlap, of course, between these syndromes. But in fact, it's the result of many interacting causes. And so you can't say, what is the cause of this person's fall? You have to say, what are the factors involved in this person's fall? And you never know which is the, the one that actually caused the fall, and that's irrelevant. What you have to do is address the factors that make that person prone to fall and try and improve those. And I can't remember if it was Churchill or some other British <coughs> politician who I was talking about, you know, they, they, uh, Great Britain and the United States were a single people separated by a common language. And, and that happens in healthcare very frequently. You use one word meaning many different things. And so for my colleagues uh, in acute medicine, and I, I, I do that, I do general medicine as well, and I'm in the hospital all the time. Uh, assessment means doing a history and physical and appropriate lab test to find out what reversible disease or exacerbation of chronic disease is there and treating it aggressively so that you can control that disease. That's important to do. If you have that, if you're somebody with acute disease, that's very important. In rehabilitation medicine, it has a very different thing. Uh, it, sorry, what, the, the disabil what disabilities you have and what strategies can overcome that disability or even reverse it. So if you've had a stroke, you know, do you need a walker? Can physiotherapy and exercise improve the weakness? Can speech and language therapy improve your language skills? So we're not talking about uh, the acute illness. We're talking about the disabilities resulting from sometimes an acute illness like a stroke. And then when we're talking about home care services, which probably have the biggest impact, they're using assessment in a totally different way. They're saying, what things can this person not do by themselves? And what services or people or things can we put in that will allow those things to happen so the person can stay at home? All three of those, we all use the word assessment. We use it somewhat differently, and then we end up arguing about who's doing the assessment. <laughs> of course, and one of the cornerstones of healthcare is always to make sure that no matter what you mean by assessment, is don't trust the other person's assessment. <laughs> uh, so do it over again, waste money, and delay the process of care. That's standard. Unfortunately, still it is, and I don't see any clear end to that. The, uh, the, the electronic data theoretically could could help that, but everybody's out there barriers with electronic data is not transferable and under different systems so that we frequently can't see it. And even when they're under one system, uh, people misinterpret privacy legislation to say that you can't pass it on. Um, the problem with geriatrics, and it, I don't consider it a problem, but it is a problem as far as complexity goes. We're, we're involved with the acute diseases, so we have to do that kind of assessment. We're involved with the rehabilitation. <coughs> In, in, uh, in England, there are very few physiatrists. Geriatricians do virtually all of the supervision and rehabilitation there, and we do a lot of it uh, here for older people. And then we're also involved in helping establish with our interdisciplinary teams, uh, working with you know, CCACs, home care providers, what uh, supports are required. So we're involved in all three. And, and most doctors are, are, are trained and are comfortable in this. And therefore, they're not interested in the other two, even though for elderly people, these are just as important. So what are the, the geriatric syndromes? The, the, the classic ones are falling and, and, and gait disturbance, if you put it, they're, they're, they're closely related. Some people put in immobility and instability, like eyes, incontinence, uh, delirium or confusion, frailty and functional decline. Some people have added pressure ulcers, dizziness, some other people will put in the apogenic factors, in other words, how doctors are screwed up to make these people sick. Um, you can put in whatever uh, you want. And it's not just doctors who do that. Uh, nurses have their uh, stick and therapists as well. There, there have been studies showing that, you know, looking at, uh, I remember one specifically on physiotherapists, showing that they're just as ageist as doctors. No difference. 
and, and I view that as none of us are anything but a reflection of the society we live in. So we're not. We're going to be. You know, there's going to be anomalies, individual anomalies, but as a group, we're simply mirrors of the society we're living in. So that whatever you see in society as a whole, you're going to see in healthcare providers as a whole as well. So these are, and and, and these are, are some of the good ones. And the, the, the prototypical one is always being false because it's it's so neat and elegant, and it sort of demonstrates. The, the approach to geriatric syndrome is probably better than the others. So that's a, one I thought I'd spend a little bit of time on. Uh, whoops. That's, that's good one if you want that. So uh, we're going to take out the sound effects. Uh, so it's a big problem. You want to find out why old people fall, what happens when they fall, and the diagnosis and prevention of falls. So the extent of the problem uh, it, you know, they, they, the studies go back to just after World War II, I think 1948, when a British investigator, Sheldon, got uh, his students, otherwise known as slaves, research assistants, whatever, to actually go door to door in the geographic districts because uh, they had the list of uh, the poll lists of who, who was living in which house, which apartment, and they knew what the age to that was listed on. Things. So every house that had somebody over age 85. They knocked on the door and interviewed the massive having fallen or almost fallen in the last year. And you know, people are going to forget some of the episodes. So it's always going to be a bit of an underestimate. But it's consistent. Every study since then has suggested a third to a half of people will fall or almost fall within a year. So it's a very common. This is people over the age of 65. So it, or this, that's, that's my view. These were studies, most of these studies are on people over the age of 65. Now obviously it's going to be weighted towards the older group. And surprise, the older you get, the more likely you are to fall. There have been a kind of a couple of anomalous studies. I think they haven't corrected for people who are bedridden or immobile, so they didn't have the opportunity to, to fall. And uh, I don't know if this is going to continue. Women fall more frequently than men at any age. And that might be because previous cohorts of women were not as physically active as men. And so therefore, their muscle development over their lifespan was not as much as men. But also the other factor is that women at any age group are more likely to have dementia. And dementia is a big risk factor for falls as well. Um, if you look at, uh, you know, uh, every day there are people who fall in emergency rooms. Uh, you're right to say that the 60 and 65 year olds don't have that many falls. And it's not start to become a really problem until you get about probably around 75. Um, and if you look in a city like Toronto, which has getting close to uh, 200,000 people over the age of 75, we're talking about uh, 20, 000, almost 20,000 falls bad enough to come to the emergency department. Um, so that's a lot. And that means that every emergency department, every day in front of several people who fall. Um, my experience has been that the evaluation of those falls is pretty dismal. But you'll understand why. It's not necessarily the fault of the people working in the emergency department. The, the, they, they, use, they have to, they're at a model where you have to have, what's the reason? What can I do to get them out, either to the, into the hospital, from sick enough, or home? Because you can't stay in the emergency department. Otherwise, the next person can't get in. Well, a year, year and a half ago, we had somebody it was so jammed up in the emergency part of the Western that somebody had a cardiac arrest in the waiting room because they couldn't find a place, even though they knew they had to find a place, they couldn't find some place for the person. So it's not their fault. We have to develop a system that way for them managing these patients. And this is uh, just to show that the uh, <coughs> majority of uh, trauma admissions in uh, Ontario are because of falls. So this is all age groups, not just uh, elderly people. So, and, and, but uh, the trauma guys hate falls, because they're not exciting enough. You know, the elderly person who's falling, they don't even put them in their statistics. Uh, they want a motor vehicle accident, where you get five surgeries off it, because it's exciting. You know, it's uh, an 85-year-old woman who cracked her hip, they don't feel as exciting. They just view that as depending on getting in a total hip replacement the next day. Um, and this is uh, just to show you that 42% uh, 
of trauma admissions in our carrier are over the age of 65. So the biggest group of trauma victims are the elderly. Not surprising. And if you look at just the elderly, this one is people over the age of 65 admitted for trauma, it's virtually all false. And if you look at other countries, then that, that pie chart looks pretty much the same, that most of the trauma admissions to hospital are, are because of falls and motor vehicle accidents you only have significantly, except for the United States. The United States is an outlier because they still have a big chunk of the pie, even in those over age 65 who are admitted to hospital because of gunshot and knife wounds, which is very unusual in 65 year olds in Western Europe and Canada with most of the other statistics. Uh, most interesting, as I said, the most interesting uh, article I ever found about elderly and uh, guns was in that noted uh, American Journal Newsweek about 1995. There was a 95-year-old man who had, had two issues that got him into a nursing home, which were that he was demented, number one, and number two, he was paranoid. But the staff of the nursing home felt he had a right to bring his high power. <laughs> <laughs> but he shot and killed two people, uh, which is not a good thing for a nursing home, I don't think. I, I think that once, you, once you've got either dementia or paranoia, you probably shouldn't be handling high power weaponry. Uh, I believe that's my opinion. I might be biased. Was that in Texas? <laughs> uh, no, it was, uh, it was in the southern United States, but it was not in Texas. I can't remember now. I have the article someplace at home. But, uh, the, the administrator didn't lose his job. <laughs> and I, I'm going to use old data simply because it's Canadian. Uh, people fall and their families put them in nursing homes for safety. <clears throat> Gravity still works in nursing homes. <laughs> <way. laughs> it's right now. And the highest rate of falls in nursing homes. Now, it's not because they push them in nursing homes, it's because the frailest of people end up in nursing homes. But, you know, the you can set up proper programs for the nursing homes to reduce the risk of falls, but not all nursing homes have them. And uh, if you, you're not really saving, uh, you're not really making a huge difference in the falls necessarily by going into a nursing home. And uh, the Baker study showed, once again, women fall more frequently, the older you are, the more likely you are to fall. And once again, uh, Mary Kennedy showed this 10 years later, that the older you are, the more likely you are to have a serious injury as well. But I, I like the Baker study because it's Canadian. It's identical to Mary's that came out 10 years later. And now this, this is the problem. The question is, why do you fall? And this, this is what happens in the emergency department. Like, do they have a, a seizure? Do they have a, a fainting episode, a Stokes Adams attack? Those cause falls. But you know, you see one of those every ten years uh, that that present as a fall. Usually, they present quite clearly as uh, as a cardiac event or a seizure. And yes, it can occur, but it's so vastly unusual that it presents as a fall that it it, uh, it shouldn't dominate. That's what because it's a single thing that can easily cause a fall. That's what dominates our thinking. And whereas, in fact, what it, it's a whole bunch of things that add together. And one of them becomes a straw that breaks the camel's back. But just removing the straw doesn't do you much good if you don't look at all the other load that the camel would bear. And there are causes that are intrinsic to the patient and causes that are in the environment. These are the more important ones. Because most elderly people are same, facing the same extrinsic environmental hazards we are, uh, just they don't have the capability to cope with it because of changes intrinsically. And that's why it doesn't mean that we shouldn't alter the environment to make it safer, but that's only going to be part of the answer. And some of the age-related changes, but we know that your your eyes change. Forget about diseases that come with aging, like cataracts, and glaucoma, macular degeneration. Your just ability to focus quickly and accurately from far to near declines. That's why we would have reading glasses. So if you're walking along. And you might not focus as well on a and not see it. The lens also yellows with age. So some of the contrasts that we see in textures on, on surfaces change as well. So you can't realize there's a little pit in the, uh, and so you take it smooth and it isn't. And even glasses won't even help that. So, uh, so that's a, a factor. Um, hearing is not important, particularly, but I know if you're 
older person window shopping on Bloor Street. There's a group of teenagers who are rushing to the varsity to see the latest uh, movie. If you hear them, uh, you take refuge in it. But if, you, <laughs> you, if you don't, they might jostle us. They're running past the thought a bit thoughtlessly. We, we also know we all get jostled all the time, right? Anybody here being on, I'm sure people, if, if not here, in webcast have sometimes been on a subway. Right? If it's rush hour, you don't have to worry about falling because you're wedged in like a sardine and there's no place to fall. But if it's towards the beginning or end of rush hour, it's, you get jostled, but there's still room to fall. And uh, we prevent ourselves from falling because we have reflex action. We get nerve, we transmit information to our nerves, which then go to our muscles. So, uh, so reaction time, which is based on nerve conduction and processing, and then go to our muscles to keep us safe contract to keep yourself up, right? So what happens as we grow older um, is that particular, the, the two, both phases of uh, reaction time, nerve conduction and central processing, either in the spinal cord or in the brain, slow down. And I like to tell my residents, um, as of when nerve conduction time starts to slow, uh, and, and that's late 20s, early 30s. <laughs> Uh, so that, you know, so, yeah, and it's always nice to let them know that they're starting to age already. That's why it's, it's called life course at aging, right? Because you, you start aging the minute you're born. That's uh, that's that's the reality, and and that's why I, my, my theory is that's why athletes hit their prime in their late twenties and early thirties because that's after that even you know strength doesn't decline because you'd be on steroids for oh, anabolic steroids for a longer period of time. So. Athletes frequently are stronger in their 30s than they were in their 20s because they're, they've been doping themselves for so long now and, and, and lifting weights and stuff, but their reaction time starts to go. And then the muscle strength goes. We don't know why it goes. So there's clearly, and I'll get into that maybe at the end, but clearly a, a large proportion of it is that older people assume that they shouldn't be as active and therefore aren't as active. So some of that loss in muscle strength, although not all of it, is due to inactivity. And the problem is once you lose particularly muscle strength in your lower legs, walking type exercises will not rebuild it effectively. You need resistance exercise. That's like rubber bands, lifting weights, an autoless machine to really get back to, to a, a high level. So it's very important to keep active so you don't lose it because it's much harder to regain it uh, in old age. But there are other factors besides an activity, most of which we don't understand at the present time. And then intrinsic balance. Uh, your ability to stay upright. Uh, you can measure that uh, on, on computer platforms with perturbations and even just things. But one of the important things is not only is, is your balance decline, the proportion of your upright balance that depends on your vision increases with age. So if you measure balance with eyes open and measure balance with eyes closed, the difference between balance, eyes open, eyes closed is much greater in old people than in young people. So you can become blind when you're young and maybe not fall, but older people who get visual impairment have a high likelihood of falling because so much of their ability to maintain upright depends on their eyesight. The liability, you can see it. If age-related changes mean that it's difficult to maintain the upright posture, well then anything that changes that, so a drug that makes you sleepy and less vigilant, well that's going to allow you to fall. Uh, if you got a bad knee so that it hurts when you put uh, weight on it, well, that's going to make you more likely to fall because you had problems with, with, with staying up. If you had a stroke, you know what I'm saying? If you, if you have heart failure, which means that your heart is not pumping out sufficient nutrients and your muscles were barely able to keep you upright before, now you're not pumping up enough nutrients to you. You understand? Similarly, you get acute pneumonia. You know, you, you, your, your oxygen level to the muscles is now going way down. They can barely, they, their, their reserve was lower because of aging. Now all of a sudden, you fall because you, and, and you wouldn't think that you could present, the presenting feature of pneumonia could be a fall, but it's not uncommon. Same with heart failure. The presenting feature of heart failure in elderly people is often a fall. Because their reserve of staying upright because of age related changes was less, and then all of a sudden, that something is added on. And uh, the environmental factors, uh, these are, are common sense, but of course we know that common sense is not all that common. Uh, 
Um, and but and uh, you know, frequently to really understand the need to a home visit because most of the falls, as we said before, occur at home because that's where a lot of frailer people spend a lot of their time. Uh, so you really need to uh, go into the house. And I think some of these are, are straightforward and obvious. Um, bifocals, particularly if you're climbing, going downstairs, are associated with increased risk of falls because you, 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 you can't see the hazards below you because you're looking through the reading part. So, so that, however, you know, there are disadvantages of not wearing, having multifocal lenses or bifocals. You gotta keep switching lenses or you gotta take off your glasses all the time to read, which is that, you know, is unpleasant. You increase the risk of losing your glasses and all those kinds of things. So, but, but it is somebody who has fallen or is close to falling, that's something to consider. Should they the walking, get rid of their uh, reading glasses and, uh, or their bifocals and use, uh, just uh, unidimensional glasses. And, and shoes, you know, we know that uh, it, it, it's straightforward that high heels and stuff like that would impair your balance. However, there are people who have been wearing high heels for 40 or 50 years and they have a contractor that replaced them and they can't wear flats. And so you have to figure out what kind of heel is the safest. Generally, a thin soled shoe will allow you to feel the ground underneath you better. So it's much safer as far as falls. However, it's always something however in geriatrics, right? If you've got a painful foot, a thick stole shoe like I'm wearing, even though your proprioception, your ability to feel the hazards is less, by reducing the pain, it might make you have a steadier gait. So even though the rule is thinner sole is safer for falls, you can't apply the rule willy-nilly. You have to apply it knowing that individual. So you can understand that you, you can't give cookie-cutter recommendations for any of these things. And, and uh, so that's why geriatrics is, is uh, in comparison to dermatology, is low volume but high intensity for each intervention because you've got to consider all those factors every time. And so the, the common scenario is that many people have four or more, have many of these predisposing factors. If you look back at them, you know, uh, do they have, they, they've had a stroke, or they have a bad knee, or they have a bad heart. They're older, so those things happen. Uh, they're wearing bifocals, whatever. Um, if you have had four more, this was four or more of these hazards, and this was shown by Mary Tanetti in the 1988 article, that you have pretty much 75% chance of falling in the next year. So you can predict who is going to fall by simply doing a proper geriatric assessment. And theoretically, you can intervene uh, we'll get to that in a sec. And then you have a precipitating factor. And the precipitating factor is most likely an environmental hazard or an acute illness. But there's still, I, I had one patient who was 95 who still liked to do his own roof work on the ladder. He had to say, no problem doing it. But it was his son who had a heart attack. <laughs> uh, but, uh, but so you've got all these internal factors, intrinsic factors, age related and disease related. And then something happens added on top and that's why it falls. So when somebody develops that, that means that they were almost there from their predisposing factor. So you can't just treat the pneumonia. You then have to go back and look at all the other things so that next time they get into a slight perturbation in their physiology, they don't fall again. Because one of the things, you can, you can look at this at the Baycrest study and Mary Tanetti study 10 years later showed very similar things, that you know, one in six people who fall get a serious injury. And, and severe soft tissue injury means you either use suturing or you couldn't use your arm or leg properly. So I'm talking about significant. And then the fracture obviously is bad. And uh, you know, for those people who say, well, you know, Collie's fracture, some of those fractures are not so bad. I, I would say that the definition of a minor fracture is the same as the definition for minor surgery. And I think everybody knows what the definition of minor surgery is. Surgery performed on somebody else. Performed <laughs> on yourself, it's never minor. And similarly, there's no such thing as a minor fracture if you get it. <laughs> and falls have terrible consequences. Uh, a lot of people really limit their life afterwards because they're scared. Uh, we did a, a study on, on what Bernard Isaac caused, called the post fall syndrome. He had a group of people in the 80s who, uh, in Birmingham, that they collected. People who think who have the strength to walk, and they can hold on to your finger and, and walk, 
But they were scared. To do that. We did a, a, a study uh, a couple of years ago at UHN at Toronto Rehab, and, and we found that, that they had a high burden of depressive symptomatology in those patients. We never did the follow up, which was to randomize some patients and, and, and treat depression. It's a hard one to do because they had a major depression have to treat anyway, so we, we never got on to it. But uh, it, it really is a life limiting event, a bad fall. And, and one of the things people say there's a trivial fall. There's no such thing for a woman person as a trivial fall. There can be a fall with trivial injury, right? But if you, the angle could be slightly different, then you'd shatter your hip. Uh, so the fall wasn't trivial. The injury that time, but the next time it might be devastating. So even a tr trivial injury means you have to closely look at all the factors. And, uh, you know, even a, the Collie's fracture, most people have had a, call, a wrist fracture when they fall. They don't get perfect recovery. The, the arm is frequently weaker. There's some residual pain even at times. Uh, it's very hard to get prevent angulation of, of the uh, of the fixation. So even that, and after a hip fracture, 50% of people don't recover their previous level of mobility. So it's not not minor. And and here's where the problem comes. There aren't any shortcuts. Yeah, I think yeah, you understand that from what I I've said is. It's anathema, a geriatric syndrome. You can't take shortcuts the way you can most in human endeavors, where there are key things that are important. Uh, you have to isolate all the possible contributing factors. And then you have to say, which of these factors can I do something about? Because clearly, you're not going to do that much about uh, advanced age or female gender, for example, which are risk factors. You know, we don't have the budget for a set in sex change that is high enough to, to handle that. And uh, so what you have to do is say, what are all the factors? Which ones can I do something about? And of those that I can do something about, which are amenable to a quick fix? I.e., some of those could be treating the pneumonia, uh, stopping the benzodiaz long-acting benzodiazepine that made the person groggy. So there are some that are amenable to a quick fix, but you can't forget the ones that are going to take long term. Is there a way that I can build up muscle strength? Uh, can we get their cataracts removed in their... So things like that, uh, you can't forget them. And that's not what we like to do in the emergency department. We like to forget them. But it's a key thing. Forget everything else. Somebody else will take care of it. But what happens in our system is nobody takes care of it. Now, we could argue, and probably persuasively, that falls are so uh, important in, in, in dealing with elderly people that every hospital should have immediate, a rapid, within 48, 72 hours, a rapid follow-up falls clinic to see all those patients. So. The, the emergency doc can make sure that one of those immediately life threatening things is not there, like a cardiac problem. Decide if the person is safe enough to go home and know that within 48 or 72 hours you're going to get that comprehensive assessment. Very difficult to do it in the emergency department. So when we failed them there. So, you know, I like to blame the emergency docs, but I really can. And, you know, when, when people do thorough histories, they don't usually speak to witnesses, so get collateral history, and that's crucial in all areas of uh, geriatrics, getting collateral history. They don't check the vision. They don't always look at all the joints, and they clearly don't always do a neurological examination. They don't measure the blood pressure standing in line, because you can get dizzy again. So those are things that are, I find are traditionally left out. And uh, so you know, and you've also got to look at environmental hazards. So that, and that usually means calling up CCAC, getting an OT to go in, all time consuming. People don't want to do that. And these are some very Tonetti developed some. These are some of the, the medical things drugs, peripheral neuropathy, stroke. They're, they're all straightforward. But once again, if you can have four or more of these, you're overwhelmingly likely to follow the next uh, year. And uh, so, as I said, you've got to determine all possible risk factors, decide what you can do something about, it, decide which factors can be addressed rapidly, and then you have to intervene. A lot of times people would say, go back to your family doctor and they'll intervene. But don't go back. It, it, it's a problem. And then you have to refer to programs that can address factors requiring long-term interventions. But those are usually not amenable to treatment in a private doctor's office. They need a rehab program, a day hospital, uh, an exercise, a formal exercise program, whatever. But you have to refer them. And then you can prevent falls. And, and, and Mary Tonetti, uh, she defined those risk factors. And she picked some of them that she thought were uh, amenable to intervention by a doctor. And so, you know, blood pressure that dropped, 
uh, sedative use, four or more drugs, impaired use of arms or legs, which a doctor who's seeing a patient should know about. And uh, she did the usual treatments and uh, tremendous risk reduction. So you can target people who are at risk for falls, so you people have four or more risk factors, or have one of four predefined risk factors for fall, you really decrease. The more of them they have, the greater the risk reduction is going to be. However, we have what do we have about 12 million people in Ontario? 13% are over age 65 with significant risk for falls. That can you imagine that evaluation being done by we don't have enough family doctors to, to put their fingers in the dike for crisis <laughs> intervention. Um, and um, so so we have to figure out something else. So if somebody is falling or almost falling, and you see somebody looks like they're about to fall, you have to do that kind of intervention. And, and that's good for that person, and it will help them. But it's not a public health intervention that's going to make a difference to our society. We've got to figure out other ways. Um, and, and one of the things that we, every hospital has a, 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 a falls prevention program. It doesn't work. There's, there's never been any evidence that they work in the hospital because you're not in there long enough to implement anything. In rehab settings, there's some evidence that you get benefits from falls prevention program. The biggest uh, bang for your buck is in long-term care facilities because people are there for four or five years and in the community because people are going to be there for quite a long time, actually. So, uh, but we, of course, put the resources where it's going to be least effective because that's who has a budget to cost us. So, if age is a major driving factor in falls and its most serious consequence, uh, and hip fractures are, are, are horrendously expensive. Uh, we, we, we're in big trouble. It turns out hip fractures are uh, increasing faster than the population's age. So if you correct for the aging, hip fractures are increasing more. We've known that since the mid-90s. Uh, we thought it was because of osteoporosis, but in fact it's probably as much because fall rates are increasing as well. New evidence has come out from the same group showing that people are falling. We don't know why. It might be that we're providing more cardiac medications, keeping people alive, doing cardiac interventions. I don't know. That's my hypothesis. But for whatever reason, the falls are increasing. And, and the problem, you know, with falls comes when, they're, when osteoporosis and falls intersect. You know, when a hockey player with big bones fall, strong bones fall, they don't break anything usually. Uh, when, but it's when you have osteoporosis as well. So the, the interventions are, you know, obviously improve bone density. And one of the things that has been proven to be feasible is anytime somebody shows up for bone density, it's, Know, an osteoporosis clinic, uh, uh, a very quick questionnaire takes you a few seconds to administer, will tell you if there are falls risk, and therefore then you have to look at all that, because that's when our interventions for osteoporosis don't work so well. Hip protectors work, but people don't like their, like they're very uncomfortable, they make your hips bigger. And so, and we sent the multimodal, multimodal to any form of falls assessment intervention programs are not going to, we don't have the resources to do them find everybody and do them. So that's why single interventions are really the thing. And, 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 uh, and that's exercise. And, and that's being pro. So Tai Chi is the best study. I don't know, it stresses balance, you know, when you're in Tai Chi, but other forms of exercise have also been uh, useful. So I, I think promoting exercise, making it cheap and easy for older people to exercise, and uh, obviously encouraging it at the younger age as well would be great. I think that this goes beyond this. I, I think, you know, design of cities and buildings is important. Oh, yeah. So clearly, you know, if, if you look at a, a simple thing to do, which is measuring people's weight, but it's correlated with activity too. Uh, you know, we know that you know, the person who at age 30 is about 130 pounds, a man is going to gain on average 10 pounds per decade over the next uh, several decades, so that at age 70, they're going to be 170 pounds. That's the average. That turns out to 10 calories per day, positive balance. That's nothing, right? 10 calories? So, and we know that it's very hard, you know, to go to the gym all the time and exercise. So we should go back to what people did in the old days, which is build activity. They didn't choose to do it. It was had before we had all our machinery and stuff. And, you know, I, I one of the hospitals in that Toronto Western built a new building without accessible staircases. So people going up one or two staircases in that building have to use the elevator. That's insanity. You know, you can see if you, if you just go to your garage and drive to the parking lot beside your office building, the number of calories used compared to walking to the subway 
getting off the subway and walking to your office the other block or two. That's how you have, we, we have to figure out a way of designing society to promote activity in day-to-day -day activities. Simple ones like, I don't, I'm not an expert at this, but you know, it drives me crazy when I drive up one or two stairs and I can't, I have to wait for the elevator and it's slow. So I, I would be doing two things. I would be relieving the congestion for others and I would be doing, benefiting myself if I ran up and down the stairs, but I, I don't have that option at times. Now, I'm, I'm not going to, uh, you can do the same thing for urinary incontinence, the same age-related changes, the same disease, diseases. Now, okay. most of the diseases are going to be focused around the bladder rather than on neurological, like uh, strokes and uh, I don't know, as well. And then once again, you know, what the opportunity environmental factors are commonest in, in hospitals that we tie people down for Dr. Vendor so can't get the bathroom. Uh, you know, so that's a, and uh, but but our bladders do change, so that we're we're, bladder, it, we don't sense that our bladder is filling up until a little bit later, and our ability to to maintain it uh, before we or we our bladder goes into spasm is less. Therefore, that the time between feeling uh, you have to go to the bathroom and we can't hold it anymore is much shorter in older people, and they get that sense of urgency. Um, so that that's a tendency, and if if you have uh, other problems with your bladder and things add up and then if you're uh, in the hospital you know you, uh, you're tied down so you can't go to the bathroom so, we're gonna, so what is so we have time for comments or questions so what, what does it mean this syndromic approach so remember once again as I said at the beginning different from the syndromes that we think about in pediatrics and general medicine where one disease, one gene, one problem cause multiple manifestations. Here we're talking about multiple things, both physiological change, disease-related changes, environmental factors uh, come together to create a very, what looks like a homogeneous pattern of response, falling incontinence, confusion. So it's very different. And by definition, we have to, uh, and the person who's written most eloquently about this is Ken Rockwood from Dalhousie. Uh, is that we have to embrace complexity, not these reductionist models. People, the older we get, the more different we become from each other. Um, you know, residents in a hospital don't seem to understand it because they see people who are sick and in bed with gray hair and they assume they're identical. But in fact, that's the opposite of, you know, and, and the way to think of it is, I, I presume most people have seen newborn babies and, you know, very few of them can speak French. Some of them don't even speak English. <laughs> Uh, very few of them are continent. They're, they're pretty much all alike in their abilities, except mine were cuter than most. Um, by the time we get to one year, one year olds, some of them being walking for months. Other than others are barely cr crawling, um, and yet they're all normal. Get to four years old, some of them can read a little bit. Others aren't even interested in books. All within normal limits. Age sixteen, some are thinking about a career in science, others are hoping to drop out of school. They're still within the normal range. So, and, and that continually, when you add in environmental and, and uh, emotional and other factors, where your life experience is getting broader and broader, but even with simple laboratory tests, the 95% the, uh, confidence interval for a laboratory test, although roughly the same in older people for most things, is wider. It doesn't come to a nice peak. It's, it's a much broader thing. So people are, are kind of more different from each other the older they become. And that requires uh, individual assessment, embracing that kind of complexity, understanding that it's not just a disease, you have to understand where they live, how much money they have. Those are enormous factors. They actually turn out to be factors in young people who are ill as well, uh, but, but you don't get burned as badly as a physician if you don't think about it, or a healthcare provider if you don't think about it. You get burned really badly with geriatrics if you don't think about it. But if you were to think about it, for those young people, you can provide better care for them as well. I have a colleague who's in a wheelchair, and she always reminds me that design for the disabled is better design. Mm -hmm. Forgetting about anything yeah, else, forgetting about the disabled, it's better design. And it's true. And uh, the problem with embracing complexity is that it's hard for one person to do it. And so if you really want to do it, do it well, you have to develop interprofessional teams. And that's been for, traditionally been the, the biggest failing in our healthcare system, the inability to draw primary care into teamwork. 
uh, you know, I don't know how our current endeavors with family health teams, et cetera, is going to work. It's in the early stages, but it, it might or might not work. I don't know. I'm not an expert in that, but the concept is obviously right. Primary care for older people requires teamwork. Uh, it's even more complicated than being in hospital, where we, where we do have, have have had teams in some cases for many years. Um, and functioning in interprofessional teams is not having a physiotherapist, having an occupation. Without trust, there's nothing. There's no team. And so I think you, you've got to develop them. You, you've got to train people to, to work in them. And you have to have a team together for a while uh, for it to work optimally. And then uh, we, we have to, you know, I always love it when, you know, articles talk about how we save these lives. I've been around for a long time. Joe and I were talking about 30 years that we've been working together. I have yet to see anybody who's lived forever. So, so I'm not sure that we save lives. So, so I, I think that modern healthcare ha has a marginal ability to alter the timing of death. But clearly, nobody's life is going to be saved because we're all going to die. Maybe not. Maybe. <laughs> but we have an aging population today much greater than we had 30 years ago. People are living to be 100. And I'm yeah, over 100. Yeah. And yeah. so managing those people. Yeah, and that's why I say so. Really, because what you're talking about in that group, if you want to talk about cure, you're talking about making them young again. We don't have the ability to do that. <laughs> and that's why management is the goal. Um, and, and you know, like there's certain things like angina. You know, if you have exertional angina, that has absolutely no effect on an elderly person's quality of life. You figure out rapidly strategies to avoid it. Uh, exertional angina is not necessarily a risk factor, a predictor of having a heart attack. You know, so people manage it. Yeah. If you can't sleep because you've got a bad hip, you can't manage it. Uh, so, uh, so that the, the the thing that most impairs quality of life in older people is arthritis. Yet most of our healthcare result things go into cancer and uh, cardiac disease. Oh, yeah. I don't say they shouldn't, but you know, we, we have to look at an objective matter to figure out what would make like people happy. In other words. If you're going to put money into research and care, you think the people are going to be the recipients of it. Should have a bit of a voice in saying where they think it should be directed, <laughs> but we don't believe in that. <laughs> and so, one of the things that we've learned when you uh, one, one of the things we've learned uh, when people have compiled those lists like Mary Jenny did about risk factors for falls is that wait a sec when you Combine a risk factor for pressure ulcers, for delirium, for incontinence, they overlap. A lot of them are the same risk factors. And uh, you know, and some of the ones you know that are obvious and key, the older you are, the more likely you are to have a geriatric syndrome. Uh, people who are not functioning well, for whatever reason, are more likely to have a geriatric syndrome. People who have cognitive impairment are more likely to have a geriatric syndrome. People who are not walking about well are more likely to have a geriatric syndrome. And there are a few others that are, 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 are common as well, probably not necessarily for every, every one of them. So all of a sudden, people are starting to ask, you know, these are descriptions, because this doesn't tell you about what's causing these things. Maybe there are some underlying shared biological processes, which would mean that if you could understand that, that you, you could maybe deal with geriatric syndromes at a different, more fundamental level. We don't know that yet. Um, but we do know that uh, there are lots of markers that correlate. So as well as those descriptions of what people are like, there are uh, underlying biological markers that also predict risk for these geriatric syndromes. Um, so we don't know what that means at the present time. Um, you know, there are a whole bunch of interleukins. There's so many of these chemicals, human necrosis factor, all of them being studied now. And the question is, is there something in a, at a, a major biological uh, uh, level that aging is inevitable, but in this case, is making you age and become frail, uh, and, and that which leads to all these kind of geriatric syndromes. We, all, we always toss around the word frail. I think if we see an elderly person who's frail, we recognize it. Trying to describe what it is for research is not so easy, and there's a there's a big consortium in Canada that's sort of leading the world trying to get more effective definitions of frailty so that you can compare. You're not comparing apples and oranges in research studies, um, but 
it's uh, it's really important because it's, it's very complicated. And even if there are underlying basic biological mechanisms, it's not going to be one. There's going to be several. And trying to understand them is going to take a lot of effort and work. And, and well, what it means is that uh, single disease animal models, like Alzheimer's disease models, are going to have limited power in unraveling complex issues. You know, you know uh, Leonard Hayflick always used to say that if you want to study diseases, you can cure all heart disease and cure all cancer. So those are the two biggest causes of death in the elderly. So to get rid of those, you increase the average life expectancy about seven years. Yeah, it, it, it just, it doesn't, um, you know, if you want to understand, understanding diseases is an important part of aging research, but you have to understand why we're aging and what are some of these underlying biological mechanisms that make us frail and prone to these syndromes and diseases. Because that, there would be a, a better chance of improving quality of life and functional ability in these people. And uh, the other thing, I think we'll, we'll We'll end here is that uh, these uh, changes have to be then these the, the new knowledge has to be translated uh, and given to the practitioners in the field and and that's we know that uh, it took a decade in Ontario before after a heart attack simple prescription of a beta blocker which is well known to decrease subsequent uh, death and, and problems took a decade before it became pretty well routine and they, they could stop looking at it as a marker of quality, right? So that's simple, right? A prescription. Whereas, you know, if you look at some of the complex interventions to prevent falls, that's something, and um, I, I didn't go through confusion, but, uh, you know, Sharon Inouye, I saw a lot of, she used to be at Yale with Mary Kennedy, but now in New York, has done a lot of research on confusion. And, and once you become delirious, hospital, your chance of dying of significant increase. Your length in hospital is going to be longer. Your functional outcome is going to be poor. So it clearly makes sense to prevent delirium if you can. And she did a study in 1999 which uh, clearly showed that you can. Very simple things. Prevent instituting protocols, mostly volunteer driven. Making sure the person get, gets up when they're in hospital. Making sure you found you you got the family bringing their glasses and their hearing aids, uh, getting the catheter out, not restraining them, uh, reorienting them if they have cognitive impairment. Just for people in geriatrics, it seems like duh, mm -hmm. but in the acute hospital, it it uh, is hard. And very few hospitals have implemented this. In comparison to some of the other interventions, or that we do, it's cheap as can be because. Usually, we recruit volunteers, volunteers like doing this. Um, and uh, there are a couple of hospitals in Hamilton that are working there, so we know it works in the Canadian healthcare system. But you know, every time also I see that hospitals in Toronto talk about implementing it, um, then the project crisis comes or some new priority comes up, it's put on the back burner. And you get articles that don't have it here, but like one in the Journal of the American Geriatric Society, where you know, hip, hip patients, you both fractures and, and particularly fractures, but also if replacement patients, have a high likelihood of delirium. And they did a study just trying to pre-treat them with haloperidol, which didn't work. <coughs> but you know, you wonder, how could you do that when you've already got a, an evidence-based intervention in the literature that you're not implementing, and you're being given a toxic pill? Why? Because for the medical mind, a pill is easier. Uh, you don't have to, you know, just write a prescription or, or write an order if, if it's in hospital. Whereas it requires changing the way we deliver care to have uh, something like sharing in the week, where, where you have to say, when they're coming, they have to be screened for carbon therapy. You have to have a reason to have a catheter. You can't just put it in. You have to, you, you're mandated to walk into the bathroom if they can walk. Like, those, those things require changing the way we run a hospital. But you know, one of the problems with going to the bathroom for seniors in hospitals is that the hospital beds are still too high for a senior who has shrunk two to four inches in height. Getting on and off the bed is a difficult situation, so that predisposes them to falls again. Some, yeah, some hospitals have invested in the lower going beds, so it's a little bit better. Um, but you know, a delirious patient, uh, for which is, you know, helping them to the bathroom, is what you have to do. Yeah, and and that's not. I, I speak from personal experience, not in the hospital, but from 
uh, this one, my father was in a very good long-term care facility. Uh, he was there during SARS, and they couldn't go in, and they didn't recognize that he was going blind from a rapid glaucoma because nobody was interested. And uh, but it turns out afterwards, when we figured out what was going on after SARS ended, it turns out that elderly people who are confused and blind still have to go to the bathroom. No kidding. Uh, I. They, well, they didn't know that at this long-term care facility, and so I asked him at, at night time to take him a couple times to the bathroom because he was getting up and falling, broke both hips and died. Oh, no. uh, because they didn't feel it was within their mandate to help a person go to the bathroom. Um, since we're focusing a lot on falls, precipitation of falls, and uh, your linkage to hip replacement, what proportion of hip replacement patients uh, are successful and what proportion uh, fall into delirium and why? So, so it, it depends, so let's separate them into two populations, hip replacement, which is extremely successful and relatively low risk of delirium mm -hmm. uh, because you've got to be aggressive to get it into the system, you usually caught the, the surgeons make sure they don't have serious underlying problems versus hip fracture. Hip fracture, people, so remember that one of the big risk factors for falling is cognitive impairment. Uh, you also have uh, poor uh, bones. You have osteoporosis, means you probably haven't been active, probably not well nourished. So we did a study looking at geriatric interventions in hip fracture patients uh, at the Toronto Western Hospital, and 50% of them, half of them became delirious. Wow. So it's, so preventing even, some of those would make a huge difference. Remember, they, they, their, their outcome is poor. They're both from a mortality, probably, but clearly from a functional point of view, and their hospital stay is longer. So, if you could prevent that, it would be a, a win win for everybody. The patients would be better, and the hospitals would, uh, would free up beds to, to treat other patients as well. So, it, it's a why we wouldn't have, why we wouldn't have embraced Sharon's, uh, Sharon Inouye's uh, model because we haven't recognized it's a problem. Uh, we focus on length of stay, not the human tragedy there. We have people who are, uh, I gave an example of the last time, who are delirious and are discharged from hospital. Yeah. And, and from Sherry Inouye's work, the, the most vulnerable people are the one, you know, pre-existing vulnerabilities predict who's going to be discharged, uh, you know, so uh, uh, still delirious from hospital. So it's like, you know, not kicking just anybody, kicking the person who's already down on the ground because it's easier to do. They're not going to complain as much. That's what we do in the hospital sometimes. And, you know, for a coroner, if you in case of people who died, you know, they were on crucial medications, discharged, delirious, not, nobody asked them if they lived by themselves or not you, and they died. Not a good outcome for reserve, you know, for elective mm -hmm. surgery. At least I don't think so. <laughs> People on the webcast have the ability to ask questions. Okay. Yeah. They have the ability, yes. They have none at the moment, but you're welcome to invite So if, they, if anybody from the, who's on the webcast, if they're still away, they'd like to ask questions, we uh, <laughs> try our best. <laughs> it's, uh, it's always said you know, that uh, generals prepare to fight the last war. Uh, and clearly, our healthcare system is, is still geared up to treat the last generation of patients. Mm -hmm. So we're exactly, exactly like generals, I guess. Mm -hmm. We're building our, our equivalent of the Maginot Line mm -hmm. before World War II, forgetting about planes and tanks. And I, it, my, my, my oldest son is a history buff. Says, why did they think like the two previous Franco-German wars, right, or Franco-Prussian and Franco-German war? The Germans bypassed France and invaded through Belgium. Why did they think that building the Maginot Line up to uh, <laughs> Belgium and not through it would prevent them from doing this? Oh, this time it wouldn't be fair to do it three times. We wouldn't do it through Belgium. <laughs> you know? and, and but we do. You know, I'm making fun of the general, but we do exactly the same. Okay, we, we've said that the, the falls are an enormous and costly problem. I uh, you know, we could probably have a, a, a rapid response fall study at every hospital in Toronto and pay it back on just fractured hips costs. But somebody else's budget that would pay for the fractured hips, so there's no incentive. 
My mother was in a small group home for 10 seniors, for 10 frail seniors. She started falling. Her room was eight by 10. So there were two issues. She had a hip replacement in 1996, and she found it easiest to get out of the left-hand side of the bed, which was closest to the wall. So she would get out and climb around the wall, on, on edge on the bed, to her walker to go to the bathroom, and the door opened in. So once she's in the bathroom, she couldn't open the door to come out, and she would fall. And they'd phone me at 5 o'clock in the morning, fortunately, it's at the top of my street, and I would go up and help her get up. She could get up a lot in her own. She, when she was falling, she just sort of let herself go, which was very interesting. They were really putting some pressure on me to get her out because she's falling. And I said, yeah, well, you know what? That's what happens to old people. I had her at a, at a family practice clinic down the street, and her GP came up to see her in January to assess her, and she said, I'm going to have follow-up with the nurse practitioner, and fortunately they did that. The beginning of February, my mother started coughing a lot. So these, oh, she's got pneumonia. So what do they do? They bring out the latex gloves, and they bring out all sterile technique, and they were all concerned about her, and they're still pushing me, you know, she, your mother shouldn't be here, you should take her to emerge, you should take her to emerge, you should take her to emerge. And I'm getting very frustrated because I'm saying, all we need, you've got two PSWs on, getting somebody who's 120 pounds up is not a big deal, and she'll help in any way she can. You just have to help her get to somewhere where she can give herself a support to get up. So finally, the coughing was getting to me, and I thought, what is it? They, I've had the GP, I've had the nurse practitioner, so I took her to the hospital. Well, it ended up that she had pulmonary edema and cardiac uh, a congestive heart failure. So now she's in an ALC bed. I find this really frustrating because, in reality, she's got all of her marbles, but she's frail. She could have gone back there, but they didn't want her back and all because of falling. She, she was stabilized in three days. Yeah, we, we don't, let's say what people have always said, we don't really have a system. We have separate compartments and sometimes- Sidles. Sometimes don't. Yeah, as Karen Goldenberg said years ago, we have sidles. Yeah, but the, uh, you know, and, and some of the things, you know, uh, where if you have you, your family that everybody is working, or a small family, and you have a, a parent who's been diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease, you know that things might progress because they're otherwise healthy and, mm -hmm. and you're not going to be able to provide 24-hour supervision in the home. It would it would make sense to say, let's start the application so we can go into a place we want, and if it comes up before we're ready, to defer it for a while. Well, the CCAC has said that's too that. much work for them now. Yeah. Well, if it's registered on a computer, so, we're, so when we talk about a patient-centered system, if you can predict something, why not plan for it? Right. But in our system now, this was this is a change over the last three or four years, I guess, five years. We used to be able to do that and just say, defer, put me down a few spots because yeah. we want to, I'm not ready. I'm not ready yet. But you could end up in a place that was close to your family. Right. Uh, where you could visit, which is important. And even you know, we 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 learned from SARS about personal protective wear and isolation and stuff. Well that'll put everybody in who the risk of anything is zero. And people become profoundly depressed, get poor care because they're isolated now. And, 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 and uh, you know, you always have to say every pill, every intervention you do has a risk. Nothing we do in life is without risk, right? Cross the street. Some people have been hit by cars crossing streets. So, therefore, you can't just look at one side of the equation and say, we're going to protect everybody by putting them in masks, it's isolating them, putting them in a. See, what is the risk of doing that? The risk is, is very significant. The quality of care for somebody who's, who's in isolation is horrific. And uh, so you really should be saying, you know, not everybody, but whatever the risk factors that make us really worry about that we have to put them in isolation. So we, we, we look at one side of the equations we usually do. We said, well, and once again, it's, it's not ref reflective of the complexity that older patients present in the system. Do I have a cookie cutter? approach that will satisfy everybody in every situation it can't be. Doesn't work. The good thing though is that as a geriatrician I feel comfortable that an algorithm will never replace me. <laughs> <laughs> Are there many uh, new doctors going into geriatrics? Not enough. So we had a dry spell uh, in the early 2000s but across the country the last year or two there have been a lot of applicants. We're full in our program in Toronto for the first time. In several really, years. How many is that? So we have uh, five 
right now. Fantastic. And uh, we have two more coming next in super. July. We'll have seven. That is just super. So it's still, we're, it's still less than what we need, but it's, it's a start. So what, uh, what makes a geriatrician and a family medicine different from a geriatrician and the internal medicine? Well, the, the uh, it's usually um, the terminology is, nobody knows what it, what it means. So usually in Canada we say specialist in geriatric medicine for somebody who's come out of internal medicine and care of the elderly specialist who's family medicine. I think the, the issue is uh, the knowledge of the diseases. So, uh, the, the complexity of disease is also high, and internal medicine has more prolonged training for those various cardiac diseases, pulmonary diseases, etc. But the approach is the same. Thank you, Dr. Goldless. That was fabulous. Thank you for inviting me. That was just terrific, Mary.